morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello again. Well, it's like I know everyone here, but as always, I try to give my little caveat that I am not a minister of any kind. And to some degree, um, it's really important that you maintain your own judgment. Remember that it's just me, Rachel. So, uh, I don't know how it works out like this, but it seems that I am always getting stuck with the really difficult biblical bits. Um, the parts that are not warm and fuzzy at all, the parts that remind us that Jesus' mission, whether he chose to accept it or not, whether it was given to him by God or given to him by his people, was to bring judgment with the grace he brought to that small community. That he was, like all the prophets in that place and time, not there because things were going well, but because there was a problem. It seems like I get stuck with the parts of the Bible that are particularly painful to me personally, and when I'd rather talk about how much Jesus loves us, and isn't that, isn't that nice? It's always something that brings me uh, a sense of conviction. We have been plowing through the Beatitudes for weeks now, and we have plowed through the part where Jesus tells us not to be discouraged every week if we are mourning, or grieving, or poor, or struggling, or victims of injustice. And we have furrowed the parts where we teach kids that Jesus really wants us to be salty sunbeams. But in the end, this is where we end up. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Why does he say that? Why does he say that now? He is at the very beginning of his ministry. This is his, this is his madness opus. Does he say this because he's interested in maintaining the possibility that he's the law and order candidate? Or does he say this because he knows what's coming? Is this a don't worry? I'm not here to abolish the law and the prophets, even though I will spend my remaining days goading your lawyers and scholars and disregarding ritual law and tradition. Until the day I die, I will be pointing out the hypocrisy of your priests and throwing bones to the Gentiles. Is he reassuring them that he is not here to abolish the essence of their identity as a people which is founded on the law? Or is he preparing them for the possibility that the law and the prophets are something different from what they imagine, something different from what they experience day to day as the law is applied to their everyday lives? For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. As a lawyer, and that's the King James Version, as a lawyer, I find this both intriguing and terrifying. What law are you talking about, Jesus? Are we talking about black letter law? That's something I like. Statutes, case law, the way the lawyer down the street got my brother Lenny off his murder charges. Of course, Jesus isn't talking about our law. He's not talking about our Constitution that's so brief that's gotten extrapolated into a U.S. code with 52 titles and the potential for being arrested for, path for over 4,500 criminal offenses. So many that at one point it was asked that the Department of Justice count them all, and they said they didn't have the resources to do that. <laughs> Jesus is not talking about our laws or the thousands and thousands of pages of administrative rules that govern agencies and the access that people have to services. He's not talking about our justice system where the rules are applied differently if you are black or white or if you are rich or poor. Jesus is talking about the Ten Commandments, which are so brief, but got themselves extrapolated into all of Leviticus, the ritual purity laws, the laws about access to the temple, the laws about medical care, the community you live in when you are ill, which is probably no community at all, the food you can eat when you're starving, He's talking about the laws about divorce and marriage, when women are considered clean or unclean, the property laws and the laws about usury, and the laws about slaves. He's talking about the laws of his people, the laws that were applied differently 
if you were a Jew or a Gentile, and the laws that were applied differently if you were rich or poor. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And what's a tittle anyway? I know someone here is a scholar and can tell me all about what a tittle is, but I thought just to make it brief. Um, it comes from the word jot, comes from the word iota, which was, I guess, mispronounced, which is the smallest letter in the Greek alphabet, and a tittle is a flourish, like the dot on an I. So you can see here, these are some Hebrew letters, which I cannot identify, but I can point out that this is the tiniest letter in the Hebrew language, and that's the jot. It looks like an apostrophe, really, but that's a whole letter. And then this is a tittle. Not, not this part, not the letter part, but this little itty bitty thing here. It's like a serif. <clears throat> and I have, for your education, I have several letters that are very similar, and the only difference between these letters is the, the little tiny tittle. So a serif can make a difference between one letter and another, and I'll pass this around later. In Hebrew, jots and tittles really matter. So it's a little bit different for us. Um, I was trying to come up with a better example because we don't have tiny letters, and if you take the dot away from the I, nothing happens at all. But what about a comma? Most of us are familiar with comma quandaries. You know the difference that that tiny, tiny little mark can make? Does your panda eat shoots and leaves? Or does your panda eat, shoot, and then leave? Would this passage seem more interesting to us or more compelling if Jesus said, until heaven and earth pass, one comma shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled? When you imagine the volumes and volumes and volumes of law, for the Jews and for ourselves, wouldn't you wonder who put the commas there? Wouldn't you wonder if they were all in the right place? If the passing away of heaven and earth will not change the placement of the commas, the jots and tittles of the law and the prophets by which we are to live, how could we ever possibly survive the weight, the weight of all of that? When I was reading some of the thoughts about this passage, there was on one hand those who said, ha ha! The law does matter. Grace is not the most important thing. Following the law is still very, very important, and we must do so fastidiously. On the other hand, there's a group of people who said, wait a minute, Jesus fulfilled everything when he died, and he was raised from the dead. We don't have to worry about following the law, in particular those pesky commandments in Leviticus, no circumcision. Also, Paul said so. Neither one of these seems right to me. For in Matthew, you can go along, and I hope you'll have a chance to plow through it, as I did the other day. Matthew portrays showdown after showdown between Jesus and lawyers and Pharisees and Sadducees. Again and again, he will say, the law is important, but that one, not so much. Exceptions must be made. Exceptions can be made for hand washing when you're really hungry. And finally, he will boil it down. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, for that is the law and the prophets. But what to make of the next bit? Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. What is that about? Why would anyone teach anyone to break the commandments? Is there someone out there wildly breaking the law and teaching others to do so? And this is where things get tricky for me. I am not necessarily a criminal. Most of the time on a good day, I do not think I should spend the rest of my life in prison. However, I break the law all the time. I break the law all the time. I break rules and laws in front of my children, particularly when it comes to speeding. I have tried to reform, and I think I have improved a little bit. But even so, I have a long list of excuses and explanations. Sometimes I'm justified because in my mind I am not choosing to sin. I am choosing between two evils, breaking the law and tardiness. 
which you all know is my other great weakness. Just yesterday, I drove Wes and three girls to Beckley, and at various times, I left everyone in our group in the dust, including Scott, which is hard to do. <laughs> the irony, of course, is that I'm a lawyer. I'm the contemporary version of a Sadducee or a Pharisee. I make my living reading the law, interpreting it, not just the law as it's written, but as it has been interpreted, but then this could be part of my problem. Reading and rereading the law, calculating how to avoid the consequences of breaking the law, looking at the factors that will influence whether or not I will receive a consequence, how great that consequence will be. That's how lawyers deal with the law. Still, I'm an officer of the court, sworn to uphold and protect the laws, whatever they may be. If I break the law, isn't this teaching others, particularly my children, to do the same thing? Doesn't this make it very unlikely that I'm going to make it to heaven? This is the job, and this was the job, of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. To interpret the laws beyond their original, the original application. To write new laws when it suited them. To apply the law selectively, to ensure the stabilization of society through the application of laws and punishment, while creating the loopholes needed to protect the powerful, to protect themselves from the burden of the law, the wives they were supposed to be married to for life, the parents they were to care for unto death, the poor who they were called to support. That was their job. In Nehemiah, we can see how somehow, somewhere, some lawyer, some Pharisee, some Sadducee said, a little usury is okay. Under certain circumstances, it's fine, even though it's forbidden. It's all right. Did that person contemplate the likelihood that his neighbors would be selling his children into slavery? Did that lawyer contemplate the likelihood that he would be enslaving his entire people by allowing this teeny, tiny infraction of God's law? Whosoever shall do and teach the commandments, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. It is painful to put myself in the shoes of these Pharisees and Sadducees. Because I would like, you know, not to be great in the kingdom of heaven, but I'd like to be able to like claw my way in there. But I know the result of the quibbling and the parsing the arguing over jots and tittles, the levying of so-called justice with only very selective mercy. The end result for Jesus in this argument with the Pharisees and Sadducees is, of course, the cross. The end result for lawyers and Sadducees and Pharisees is that they will bear the burden of having put him there. Whosoever shall do and teach the commandments, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What commandments should we then be following? If even Jesus will make an example of some of them, some of the laws that he does not think are particularly necessary, that trump the laws that might not trump the value of human life, for example. What should we follow without wavering beyond the ability, the will, the morality of Pharisees, Sadducees, and lawyers such as myself? In the following parts of the Beatitudes and the sermon that follows, Jesus will give us many rules. It turns out that Jesus thinks people should be married for life. The children should respect their parents. But he scorns the loopholes that are created by people such as myself, for the powerful, for the wealthy, for people who are in charge, people who know better. But Matthew gives us Jesus' final word. What are the greatest commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart. And do unto others as you would have them do unto you. These are the law and the prophets. These are the commandments that will steer you away, steer me away, 
from the quibbling, the parsing, and the wrongdoing of the lawyers and the Pharisees and the Sadducees that led Jesus to the cross and the Israelites to usury and slavery. These are the statutes and the precepts that we are called to love in the Psalms. So for you, as this week unfolds, I pray that your eyes will be open to the law. We don't often think about it. We're not lawyers too much. The way it is used and misused and our part in it. And where you can bring your experience of grace to those situations. I pray that you bring the band-aids to those situations to those hearts that you serve, and that you have the wisdom and the mercy to put them in the right place.